Welcome to this workshop on meta-analysis. This video is one in a series, and I recommend this one if you plan to work with the standardized mean difference or the mean difference. This video includes both a basic section and also an advanced section. I'll cover the following items. How to enter data, how to run the analysis, how to estimate the mean effect size, how to understand heterogeneity in effects, how to report the results, and how to create plots. I will also cover the following topics, how to perform a subgroups analysis, how to perform a meta-regression, and how to assess the potential impact of publication bias. I'll be using the software Comprehensive Meta-Analysis, or CMA. Our website is metaanalysis.com. There, you can download a free trial of the software and also the data sets used in this video. This analysis is discussed in the text Introduction to Meta-Analysis, Second Edition, and in our book Common Mistakes in Meta-Analysis and How to Avoid Them. This analysis includes 17 studies that look at the impact of methylphenidate on cognitive function in adults with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. All studies were randomized controlled trials, RCTs, in which patients were randomized to either methylphenidate or to a placebo. At the conclusion of each study, patients were assessed on some scale of cognitive functioning. Each study reported the mean score for the treated and control groups. The effect size index is the standardized mean difference, D. This example is based on data from a systematic review that was published by Castells et al. in 2011. If you're interested in the specifics of this analysis, please don't rely on this video, but consult the original paper. First, let's look at the data in Excel. The file is called adhd.xls. There's a column here with the study names. Typically, studies report the mean, standard deviation, and sample size for each group. In this analysis, however, each study employed a unique scale to assess the outcome, and so the means are not informative. Therefore, the authors of the systematic review simply reported the standardized mean difference and its standard error. And that's what we have over here. This column holds the standardized mean difference, and this column holds the standard error. There are also some columns with potential moderating variables, and we will discuss these later. I want to copy this data into CMA. I'll highlight all the relevant cells. Notice that I'm including the row with the labels. I click Control C to copy. I'll open CMA. I'll close this box. I click in this cell, and I click Control V to paste. I want to take these labels and move them into the header. I click Format, Use First Row as Labels. At this point, the labels are correct, but I still need to identify the function of each column. On the menu, there's a button that I can use to insert columns, and there is a separate button that I can use to identify the function of columns. Since the columns are already in the grid, and I want to identify their function, I'll use identify rather than insert. I click on the first column. Then I click identify column for study names. The program changes the header to study name. I click Identify column for effect size data. The program opens this wizard. CMA will accept data in many formats, so I need to tell the program which format I want to use. I also have the option of entering data for some studies in one format, for other studies in a second format, and so on. 
At the bottom, I choose Show All 100 Formats, and I click Next. Here, I need to choose from one of four options. This is the one that will allow me to compare two groups. I choose that and click Next. On this frame, I choose Continuous Data Means because I'll be comparing the means in two groups. Since I already have the standardized mean difference for each study, I choose Computed Effect Sizes. And then I choose Cohen's D and Standard Error. If I were inserting these columns, the Finish button would light up. However, since the columns already exist and I need to match each column with its function, the Next button lights up. I click Next. Here, I need to identify the column that holds the standardized difference in means. I click here, and I scroll down to the column labeled Cohen's D. Next, I need to identify the column that holds the standard error. I click here, and I scroll down to the column labeled SE. I need to identify the column that holds the sample size for the first group. I don't have that, so I'll skip it. And I need to identify the column that holds the sample size for the second group. And again, I don't have that, so I'll skip it. And finally, I need to identify the column that holds the effect direction. I'll discuss that a little later, but I don't have that, so I'll skip it. I click Finish. The program has now created a set of columns to hold the data that we need to enter for the effect size. This column has been labeled standardized difference in means, and this column has been labeled standard error. Recall that we don't have columns for the sample size, and so the program created them. This column is labeled group A, N, where N stands for sample size, and this column is labeled group B, N. The program opens a wizard that allows me to assign my own labels to the two groups. I'll call this drug, and I'll call this placebo. I click OK, and the program applies those labels. This is drug N, and this is placebo N. And finally, we have a column called effect direction. If I click on any cell in this column, the program opens a drop-down box with three options. These are auto, positive, and negative. Auto means that the program will take whatever sign it finds here and keep that sign. Any effect size that is negative will stay negative, and any effect size that is positive will stay positive. That's what I want, so I click Auto for this cell. As soon as I do that, the program computes the effect size that it will be using in the analysis and displays that here. Then I use Control-C to copy this cell. I highlight all the other cells in this column and then I click Control-V to paste. Now the program displays the computed effect size for all studies. In this analysis, I was able to use auto for effect direction because the direction had the same meaning in all studies. An effect size less than zero always meant that the placebo group did better, and an effect size greater than zero always meant that the treated group did better. When I choose auto, the program simply takes the direction as entered, which is what I want. But what happens if that is not the case? Suppose that in some studies, a negative effect size means that the placebo group did better, but in others, it means that the drug group did better. This might be the case, for example, if some studies recorded the number of questions each person answered correctly, while others recorded the number of mistakes. In this case, we could not use auto. Instead, we would manually assign a direction to each effect. I would need to look at each study. And then if the placebo group did better, I would classify the direction as negative. The program would put a minus sign in front of the effect size. And if the drug group did better, I would classify the direction as positive and the program would put a plus sign in front of the effect size.
By default, the program is displaying three effect size indices. This is the standardized difference in means, sometimes called Cohen's D. And this is an alternate version of the standardized difference in means, sometimes called Hedges G. To compute Hedges G, we would need the sample size in each group. And since we don't have that, this column is blank. This is the raw difference in means. We can only use this if all studies used the same scale, and here it would have no meaning. Since I'm not using these columns, I'd like to hide them. To modify the display, I can right-click on the yellow columns, and I click the option to customize the display. The program opens this wizard. By default, the program has checked the three effect size indices that we just discussed. I'm going to remove the check mark for hedges G, and I'm going to remove the check mark for the difference in means. At the bottom, I can check the option to show the standard error, and I can check the option to show the variance. I want to check both of these, and then I click OK. Now the program is displaying the standardized difference, Cohen's D, and it's displaying the standard error and the variance of that effect size. I also need to assign a function to these other columns. I'll come back and do that later. This would be a good time to save the file. I click the Save icon and I give the file a name. I click Run Analysis. Here, I can select an effect size index. I'll be using the standardized difference in means. At the bottom of this screen, I can choose either the fixed effect model or the random effects model. I choose the random effects model for three reasons. First, it allows me to take account of the study-to-study -study variance when assigning weights to each study. Second, it allows me to assess the dispersion and effect size across studies. And third, this model will allow me to generalize from the studies in the analysis to the universe of comparable studies, which is what I intend to do. Next, I'd like to set the scale for the forest plot. I right-click on the plot, I select Scale, and I set the scale to minus 2 to plus 2. I'd like to sort the studies by effect size so that I can get a general sense of how widely the effect size varies across studies. I right-click on the column labeled Standardized Difference in Means, and I click Sort from Low to High. I get the sense that the effect size in most studies falls in the range of around 0 to 1. But there are a few studies with effect sizes outside that range. In any event, this is only intended to give me a general sense of the dispersion. We'll compute the actual dispersion momentarily. First, let's look at the mean effect size. Each row displays the effect size for a single study, and this row displays the effect size pool across all studies. This column displays the effect size, which is the standardized difference in means. This column displays the standard error of the effect size. This column displays the error variance of the effect size. This column displays the lower limit of the effect size. This column displays the upper limit of the effect size. If I wanted to test the null hypothesis that the mean effect size is zero, I would use these two columns. This column gives me the Z value for that test, and this column gives me the P value for that test. First, let's look at the mean effect size. The mean effect size is 0.506. We see that here, and we see it here. On average, in the universe of populations that are comparable to those in the analysis, the treatment increases cognitive function 
by roughly 0.5 standard deviations. The confidence interval tells me how precisely we've estimated the mean effect size. The confidence interval is 0.361 to 0.650. We see that here and here. The mean effect size in the universe of comparable populations probably falls in the range of 0.361 to 0.650. If we wanted to test the null hypothesis that the mean effect size is zero, the z-value for that test is 6.862, with a corresponding p-value of less than 0 0.001. We see that here, and we also see it here in that the confidence interval excludes zero. Next, I'd like to know about the dispersion in effects. Typically, at this point, we would report the Q value, I squared, and Tor squared. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about what we actually have in mind when we ask about heterogeneity. And then, I'm going to show that these statistics do not actually tell us what we want to know. After that, I'm going to introduce a statistic that does tell us how much the effect size varies across studies. To avoid confusion, let me address a common mistake. A moment ago, I spoke about this line, which reflects the confidence interval. Many researchers believe that this line tells us something about the dispersion in effects. It does not. It tells us how precisely we've estimated the mean effect size. It says nothing about how widely the effect size varies from study to study. This line is sometimes displayed as it is here, and is sometimes displayed as a diamond, as it is in this version of the plot. But in either case, the meaning is the same. The confidence interval is an index of precision, not an index of dispersion. It tells us nothing about how widely the effect size varies across studies. To get a general sense of the heterogeneity, I can sort the studies by effect size as I did a moment ago. However, this plot is not as informative as we might expect for several reasons. In particular, the distribution shown here is the distribution of observed effects, which includes sampling error. What we really care about is the distribution of true effects. And that is what we would see if we could somehow remove the sampling error. To compute the actual amount of dispersion, we do something similar to what we would do in a primary study. We compute the standard deviation of true effects, and then we compute an interval based on the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. If we can assume that the effects are normally distributed in the relevant units, we would expect that the true effect size in 95% of all comparable populations will fall within that interval. I'm going to switch to a plot that actually shows the entire distribution of true effects. Unlike the current plot, which shows the effects only for the populations actually included in the analysis, this plot shows the distribution of effects for the universe of all comparable studies. And unlike the current plot, which shows the distribution of observed effects, this plot is intended to show the distribution of true effects. In other words, this plot is supposed to show what the distribution of effects would look like if we could somehow remove the sampling error. I've set the scale to go from 0 to 1. An effect size of 0 would indicate that the treatment had no effect. An effect size in the range of 0.20 might be considered a small effect. The clinical impact would be trivial in the sense that most patients would not be aware of a change. An effect size in the range of 0.50 might be considered a moderate effect.
Most patients would be aware of the change, and in some cases, their colleagues would notice the change as well. An effect size in the range of 0.80 might be considered a large effect. Most patients would be aware of a substantial change in their cognitive function, and in most cases, their colleagues would notice the change as well. The mean effect size is 0.506 or 0.51. I'll plot that here. I can add the confidence interval and the caption. The caption reads, the mean effect size is 0.51 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.36 to 0.65. In other words, we estimated the mean effect as 0.51, but the true mean could fall anywhere from here to here. As I mentioned before, all of this deals with the average effect size. It says nothing about how the effect size in individual studies varies from that mean. Let's look at that now. In a real analysis, I would simply plot the distribution of true effects. However, for the purpose of this video, I'm going to present three possible distributions and then ask which one applies in our analysis. I'm doing this to make it clear what we have in mind when we ask about heterogeneity. For clarity, I'll use round numbers, which might differ slightly from the numbers displayed on the screen. Here is one possible distribution. This line shows the distribution of true effects. At one extreme, there are some populations where the effect size is 0.25, and at the other extreme, there are some populations where the effect size is 0.75. The actual numbers are presented in this caption, which reads, the true effect size in 95% of all comparable populations falls in the interval 0.25 to 0.75. This interval, 0.25 to 0.75, is called the prediction interval. If I were asked to predict the impact of treatment in any one population, selected at random, from the universe of populations that are comparable to those in the analysis, I would predict that the impact would fall in this interval, and I'd be correct some 95% of the time. In the other 5% of cases, the true effect size would fall to the left of here or to the right of here. So the prediction interval simply gives me the endpoints of this plot. Or does the distribution of effects look like this? At one extreme, there are some populations where the effect size is 0.15, and at the other, there are some populations where the effect size is 0.85. In this case, the prediction interval is 0.15 to 0.85. Or does the distribution of effects look like this? At one extreme, there are some populations where the effect size is 0.05, and at the other extreme, there are some populations where the effect size is 0.95. These are three possible examples of what the distribution of effects might look like. Of course, there are an infinite number of other possible distributions. I've picked these three to illustrate my point, which is simply that when we ask about heterogeneity, this is what we have in mind. We want to know what the distribution of effects looks like. So which of these three plots correspond to the actual distribution of effects in this analysis? Because this is so important, I would assume that this information is included in any paper that reports the results of a meta-analysis. As it turns out, however, I would be wrong. There are three statistics that researchers typically report to describe heterogeneity. To see these statistics in the CMA, I click Next Table, and I scroll over to the right. And the statistics are presented here. These are the Q-value, along with its degrees of freedom and P-value, the I-squared statistic, and TOS-squared. However, as we will see momentarily, these statistics don't actually tell us how much the effect size varies. The first statistic reported is the Q-value, along with its degrees of freedom and P-value. 
In this case, the Q value is 30.106, the degrees of freedom is 16, and the P value is 0 0.017. On that basis, does the distribution of effects look like this, like this, or like this? The answer is, there is no way to know. It could be any of these. The next statistic reported is I squared. In this case, I squared is 46.855%. Let's call that 47%. On that basis, does the distribution of effects look like this, like this, or like this? It could be any of these. I recognize that this statement will probably come as a surprise, but ask yourself this. I've given you the value of I squared, which is 47%. Which of these plots actually corresponds to the distribution of true effects? You may or may not guess correctly, but your choice will be a guess because I squared does not provide that information. And finally, the last statistic typically reported is Tau squared, the variance of true effects. In this case, Tau squared is 0 0.039. On that basis, does the distribution of effects look like this, like this, or like this? It actually is possible to determine which of these is correct based on Tau squared, but few people know how. So, what statistic does tell us how much the effect size varies? That statistic is called the prediction interval. Here, I would report that the true effect size in 95% of all comparable populations falls in the interval 0.05 to 0.95. And that corresponds to this distribution. Where do I locate the prediction interval? If I'm using CMA version 4, I can simply click this button and the program creates this plot. This caption reflects the information about the distribution. It reads, the true effect size in 95% of all comparable populations falls in the interval 0.05 to 0.95. If you're using an earlier version of CMA or if you're using another program entirely, you can still create the plot. To do so, you can download a free program on our website. You would simply enter four values as shown here. The mean effect size, the upper limit of the confidence interval, Tor squared, and the number of studies. And then click Next to create the plot. To this point, I've explained that the key statistic to address the dispersion in effects is the prediction interval. What about the other statistics? What do the p-value, i-squared, and tau-squared tell us? Later in this video, when I explain how to report the results of a meta-analysis, I provide a one-sentence description of each. However, to actually explain what each of these tells us is really a separate lecture. For those of you who are interested, the lecture is available at metaanalysisworkshops.com. And this is also addressed in the text, Common Mistakes in Meta-Analysis and How to Avoid Them. The relevant chapter is available for free as a PDF on the book's website. I encourage you to take advantage of these resources. A primary benefit of a meta-analysis is that it enables us to see how the effect size varies across studies. We should always be sure to report this information and to do so in a way that is clear and informative, that is, by reporting the prediction interval. There is one very important caveat to all of this. In order to estimate heterogeneity reliably, we need a minimum number of studies in the analysis. The number of studies needed will vary based on several factors. However, we might use 10 as a useful minimum. 
when there is variation in the effects and there are less than 10 studies in the analysis, we cannot have confidence that any of the statistics related to heterogeneity will be reliable. This includes I squared, TO squared, and the prediction interval. Now let's have a look at how we might explain the results. In CMA version 4, I click this button, and the program displays this page, which reads as follows. Overview. The analysis is based on 17 studies. The effect size index is the standardized difference in means, D. The results of this analysis will be generalized to comparable studies, and therefore, the random effects model was employed for the analysis. And here I would indicate what an effect size on either side of zero represents. For example, if it favors the treated group or the control group. What is the mean effect size? The mean effect size is 0.506 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.361 to 0.650. The mean effect size in the universe of comparable studies could fall anywhere in this interval. The z-value tests the null hypothesis that the mean effect size is zero. The z-value is 6.862, with a corresponding p-value of less than 0 0.001. Using a criterion alpha of 0 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that in the universe of populations, comparable to those in the analysis, the mean effect size is not precisely zero. How much does the effect size vary across studies? The Q statistic provides a test of the null hypothesis that all studies in the analysis share a common effect size. If all studies shared the same true effect size, the expected value of Q would be equal to the degrees of freedom, which is the number of studies minus one. The Q value is 30.106 with 16 degrees of freedom and a p-value of 0 0.017. Using a criterion alpha of 0 0.10, we reject the null hypothesis that the true effect size is the same in all these studies. The I-squared statistic is 47%, which tells us that some 47% of the variance in observed effects reflects variance in true effects rather than sampling error. Tor squared, the variance of true effect sizes, is 0 0.039 in D units, and Tor, the standard deviation of true effect sizes, is 0.197 in D units. If we assume that the true effects are normally distributed in D units, we can estimate that the prediction interval is 0.058 to 0.953. The true effect size in 95% of comparable populations falls in this interval. Please note that my intention here is not to have the program write the report. I'm simply trying to ensure that the statistics are interpreted properly. Next. I want to create a high-resolution version of the forest plot. First, I want to modify this screen. I want to hide some columns, which will leave more room for the remaining columns. I right-click in this area to open a panel. I'll remove the check mark for the standard error. I'll remove the check mark for the variance. And now the screen looks like this. I click High Resolution Plot. I click Reset All. I want to set the dimensions of the plot to match the newer version of PowerPoint. If I'm using version 4 of CMA, that will be the default. If I'm using version 3 of CMA, I would click File, Page Size, and Margins. Then I'd set the width to 1600, 
and the height to 900. I'll leave the left and right margins at 50, and I'll change the top and bottom margins to 20. Next, I right-click on the title. I edit the title to Methylphenidate for adults with ADHD. There's an area over here called the right buffer. This leaves space on the right side of the forest plot in case I want to add additional columns there. In this case, I don't, and so I want to remove the buffer. I right-click on the plot and click Spacing and Forest Plot Width. I click Right Buffer, and then I click Remove. I want to add space between the columns. I click Column Spacing, and then I click the button with two blue arrows. I want to increase the size of the plot. I click Forest Plot Width, and I click the button with one blue arrow. The two sides of the plot are labeled Favors A and Favors B. I know that the left should be Favors Placebo and the right should be Favors Drug. I know that because I checked this on the data entry screen. Now I can enter those labels here. I right click on Favors A. I enter the labels Favors Placebo and Favors Drug. I'd like to send this to PowerPoint. I click File, Export to PowerPoint. The program opens PowerPoint and inserts the plot. I'll return to CMA. Back in CMA, I choose Colors for Slides. I can modify any or all of the colors, and then send this to PowerPoint again. I can also send it directly to Word, or I can save it as a file and import it into any program. Next, let's plot the distribution of true effects. In CMA version 4, I simply click this button to get the plot. I can edit almost any element on the plot. I'll change the title to Methylphenidate for adults with ADHD. As before, I can click File, Export to PowerPoint. If you're using CMA version 3, you would use the program on our website to create the plot. That's it for the basic analysis. When we analyze a primary study, we typically perform a sensitivity analysis. This means that we might perform a series of analyses to ensure that the results are robust. For example, we might want to ensure that the results were not overly influenced by one outlier. We could do something similar in a meta-analysis. Here, I'll outline some procedures that we might want to include as part of a sensitivity analysis. One issue we might want to explore is how much of an impact each study has on the analysis. Recall that the summary effect size is a weighted mean of the individual effect sizes we might want to see how much weight was assigned to each study. If I click this button, I can display a column with the relative weight assigned to each study. Initially, these bars are on a scale of 0 to 100. To see the weights more clearly, I can right-click here, and then I choose Scale Relative to Maximum. This changes the scale so that differences among weights are easier to see. Additionally, I can sort by relative weight. I right-click on the weights, 
I select sort from high to low. We can see that no study gets more than 11% of the weight. This tells me that I don't need to be concerned that any one study dominated the analysis. I also see that almost every study gets at least 4% of the weight. And this tells me that most of the studies played a role in the estimates of the mean effect and heterogeneity. Another type of sensitivity analysis is to ensure that the results are robust in the sense that the basic conclusions are not dependent on any one study. To look at this, we could run the analysis with only the first study removed, then with only the second study removed, and so on. CMA allows us to perform this sensitivity analysis with one click. First, I'm going to resort the studies by effect size. Let's focus on Spencer B, since this is the study with the highest effect size, which is 1.3. At the bottom of the screen, I have a tab for basic stats and a tab for one study removed. I click on the tab for one study removed. Now, the row labeled Spencer B does not show the results for Spencer B. Rather, the row for Spencer B shows the results for an analysis based on all studies except for Spencer B. On the row labeled Spencer B, the effect size is 0.467. And this is what we would see on the yellow line if we ran an analysis using the other 16 studies. Recall that the mean effect size with all 17 studies was 0.51. Now we know that without this study, the mean effect size would have been 0.47. So this study pulled the mean effect to the right from 0.47 to 0.51. From a clinical perspective, a mean effect size of 0.47 is essentially the same as a mean effect size of 0.51. So the essential conclusions would remain the same if we removed the study from the analysis. As I scan the set of analyses, I see that regardless of which study I remove, the basic conclusions remain unchanged. This row continues to show the original results and if I compare each row to this row, I see that the mean effect size never moves to the left nor to the right by enough to change the clinical implications of the finding. If we're concerned about a test of the null hypothesis, the p-value is always less than 0.001. So this plot allows me to report that the results are robust in the sense that the conclusions remain essentially the same with any one study removed. I'll click basic stats and return to the standard analysis screen. Next, I'd like to perform an analysis for publication bias. The logic of publication bias is discussed at length in another module. Here, I'll focus on the results. I'll click analyses, publication bias and the program displays what is traditionally known as a funnel plot. The large studies are plotted at the top, and small studies are plotted at the bottom. This line corresponds to the mean effect size, and the diamond corresponds to the mean effect size and its confidence interval. Initially, the mean and confidence interval are based on the fixed effect model. Since we're working with the random effect model, I'll select that here. The mean and confidence interval now match those we saw on the main analysis screen. On the main screen, the anchor was at zero, and here the anchor is at the mean effect size. This makes it easier to see how studies vary about the mean. Most models of publication bias assume that most of the large studies have been published. That's because large studies tend to be statistically significant, even when the effect size is relatively small. And 
even when these studies are not statistically significant, there are various incentives to publish them. Therefore, we expect all of the large studies to be published and based on the laws of statistics to be evenly distributed on either side of the mean. By contrast, we expect that only some of the smaller studies have been published. Specifically, small studies that reported large effects would tend to be statistically significant and likely to be published. By contrast, small studies that reported smaller effects might not be statistically significant and might not have been published. If there's no publication bias, we would expect to see large studies evenly distributed on both sides of the mean. And we would also expect small studies to be evenly distributed on both sides of the mean. On the other hand, if there is publication bias among the small studies, that would mean that there are studies missing over here And so we would expect the mean for the small studies to be higher than the mean for the large studies. On that basis, most procedures that look for publication bias look to see if the mean for these studies is higher than the mean for these. In order for these procedures to be useful, we need to have a reasonable number of large studies and a reasonable number of small studies in the analysis. I don't think that we have that here. Small studies would appear down here, and we don't have many. Nevertheless, I'll run through these procedures to show how they are intended to work. And for that purpose, I'll refer to these studies as small. At the top, where we plotted the large studies, there are roughly an equal number of studies on either side of the mean. Toward the bottom, where we plotted smaller studies, there may be five or more studies to the right of the mean, but only three studies to the left of the mean. The concern is that there may have been studies that reported effects in this area, but that were not published and therefore not included in the analysis. The idea is that if we could somehow recover those studies and add them to the analysis, the mean effect size might shift to the left. To assess the potential impact of publication bias, I would proceed as follows. First, I need to decide if I expect studies to be missing to the left of the mean or to the right of the mean. The mean is here, and the null value is here. Non-significant studies will fall closer to the null value, which in this case is to the left of the mean. So that is where I would expect studies to be missing. I click View, Trim, and Fill. I click Look for Missing Studies to the left of the mean. There's an option to use either the Fixed Effect Model or the Random Effects Model to look for the missing studies. While we will be using the Random Effects Model to conduct the actual analysis, there is still a convention to use the Fixed Effect Model to look for missing studies. If I want to follow that convention, I make that selection here. And then I click Final Plot. Finally, I click Plot Observed and Computed. The Trim and Fill procedure determines that there is an imbalance with more studies on the right than on the left. On the assumption that the studies on the left actually do exist, but were never published, the method imputes those studies and adds them to the analysis. We can see them here. On the bottom, we now have two diamonds. Based on the original studies, the mean effect size and its confidence interval would be here. Based on the original studies plus the imputed studies, the mean effect size and its confidence interval would be here. To see the actual values, corresponding to these diamonds, I can again click View, Trim, and Fill. As I mentioned before, there's a convention to use the fixed effect model for determining how many studies might be missing. Even if we adopt that convention, when we rerun the analysis with the inclusion of these studies, we still want to apply the random effects model.
This section shows the results for the random effects model, and it's the one that we want to use. This row shows the results based on the 17 actual studies and corresponds to the open diamond. And this row shows the results based on the 17 actual studies plus the two imputed studies and corresponds to the closed diamond. It's important to interpret these numbers correctly. The main take-home message is this. If there is bias due to missing studies, the basic conclusions remain unchanged. We estimated the mean effect size as 0.51. If the true effect size actually is 0.44, the clinical utility of the drug is essentially unchanged. The difference between 0.51 and 0.44 is trivial in this context. Notice that I said if there is bias due to missing studies, because that might not be the case. The trim and fill procedure, like most procedures to assess publication bias, looks to see if the effect size for small studies tends to be larger than the effect size for large studies. If we find few studies here and more studies here, we might assume that these studies actually exist but are missing from the analysis. However, that might not be the case. It's entirely possible that small studies do actually tend to show larger effects. And in that case, the original value of 0.51 would be the value that we want to use. The bottom line is that the adjusted value of 0.44 is not intended to serve as the correct value. Rather, it's intended to serve as a kind of sensitivity analysis. It tells us that if there are studies missing, the basic conclusions would remain the same. CMA is able to run various other tests for publication bias. I won't discuss them here, but simply mention that these include the failsafe N, the rank correlation test, and Egger's regression test. Additionally, if you click View Report, the program will generate a detailed report that discusses all of these analyses and how to understand them. In part one, I started by showing how we could estimate the mean effect size and the dispersion in effects. Then I took a tangent to discuss sensitivity analysis. We discovered that the basic analysis is robust. It is not dominated by any one or two studies. The results are relatively stable, and the key conclusions are not an artifact of publication bias. On that basis, let's return to the main results. The mean effect size is 0.51, which we elected to call moderate based on the clinical description. But we also know that the effect size in any given study may fall some distance from the mean. In part one, I showed how we could use this data to estimate the distribution of true effects. And that distribution looked like this. At one extreme, there were studies where the drug had virtually no impact. And at the other extreme, there were studies where the drug had an enormous impact. To understand why this matters, let's consider another analysis. Suppose we had a drug with a mean effect size of around 0.50 and a prediction interval of 0.40 to 0.60. In that case, the drug would have pretty much the same effect size in any population. If someone asked, what will the impact be for this patient? We could say that for patients of this type, the predicted effect falls close to 0.50. By contrast, consider the actual results in the current analysis. The mean effect size is around 0.50, but the prediction interval is roughly 0.05 to 0.95. If someone asked what will the impact be for this patient, the prediction interval is so wide that it's not really useful. 
What we want to do is to identify factors that might explain some of this variation. Eventually, we would like to be able to say that for this patient, we expect the effect size to be near 0.1, and so the drug would not be recommended, while for this patient, we expect the effect size to be near 0.90, and so the drug would have a major effect. There are two procedures we employ to identify factors that are associated with the size of the effect. These are subgroup analysis and meta-regression. Here, I'll show how these procedures can be applied in this case. Let's return to the data entry screen. The columns over here hold data for variables that might be related to the effect size. This one is SUD, which stands for Substance Abuse Disorder, and each study is coded either Y or N. Y means that some of the study's patients were abusing drugs, and N means that the study excluded patients who were abusing drugs. We need to tell the program that this is a moderator variable. I double-click on the title, SUD. The column function is a moderator. And we also need to specify the data type. The options here are categorical, integer, or decimal. We would use integer if this was something like the year of publication. And we would use decimal if this was something like dose. In this case, we're dealing with categories, yes and no, and so we use categorical. Next, I want to assign a function to the column labeled dose. I double-click on the title, dose. The column function is a moderator, and the data type is decimal. Now we can return to the analysis screen. I click Run Analysis. I click Random Effects. I click Computational Options and Group By. The only option displayed here is SUD, and that's because this was the only moderator that was defined as categorical. I select SUD. I add a check mark to each of these options, and I click OK. Finally, I'll right-click on the column with the standardized mean difference and sort from low to high. These are the studies that excluded SUD patients. The mean effect size is 0.58. And these are the studies that included SUD patients. The mean effect size is 0.16. To get a better sense of the difference between the two, I can hide the individual studies and display only the summary rows. To hide the individual studies, I deselect this button. For studies that excluded SUD patients, the mean effect size is 0.58. For studies that included SUD patients, the mean effect size is 0.16. I think it's clear that the difference is clinically important. And additionally, I can see that there is almost no overlap between the two confidence intervals. And so I expect that the difference in means will be statistically significant. We'll look at that in a moment. I'll click this button again to redisplay the individual studies. Next, I want to ask if this difference is statistically significant. I click Next Table. Here, there's a section labeled Mixed Model. This is the section I want to use. I'll explain later what it means. The mean effect sizes are the same ones that we saw a moment ago. For the 13 studies that excluded SUD patients, the mean effect size is 0.577. For the four studies that included SUD patients, the mean effect size is 0.162. To compare this mean versus this one, I can use a Q test. The Q value is 6.130 with one degree of freedom and a p-value of 0.013. I would reject the null hypothesis that the mean effect size is the same here and here, and I would conclude that the effect size is higher here. So to recap, 
we've concluded that the difference between this mean and this one is statistically significant. I wanted to start with that conclusion, but in running these computations, I made a series of decisions. I need to discuss what those decisions were and why I made them. And we also need to discuss what conclusions we can draw from the analysis, and equally important, what conclusions we cannot draw from the analysis. The first issue I want to discuss is the choice of a statistical model. As always, at the bottom of the screen, we can select either the fixed effect model or the random effects model. I selected the random effects model. Let's be clear about what that means. When we're performing a simple analysis without subgroups, the difference between fixed effect and random effects is as follows. We would use the fixed effect model if we believed that all studies were based on the same population and were identical to each other in all important respects. For example, the fixed effect model would apply if the true effect size for all studies fell directly on this line and the observed effects deviate from the line only because of sampling error. The true effect size is the same in all studies because all studies are based on the same population. The results would apply to that population only and could not be generalized to any other populations. By contrast, we would use the random effects model if we believed that studies were based on different populations or varied from each other in meaningful ways. For example, the true effect size for the various studies might fall along this line. The true effect size varies from study to study because each study is based on a unique population. The results would apply to the universe of comparable populations. As I've explained elsewhere, on that basis, the random effects model is almost always the one that we want to use. The same idea applies here, except that now we apply this criteria within subgroups. And again, on that basis, the random effects model is almost always the one that we want to use. For example, consider the studies in this subgroup. If we believed that these studies were all based on the same population, and were identical to each other in all important respects, we would use the fixed effect model to estimate the common effect size here, and that effect size would apply only to that one population. However, that is clearly not the case. While these studies are similar to each other, in the sense that they all excluded SUD patients, they are not based on the same population, and they do vary from each other in many important ways. Therefore, we apply the random effects model here. And this allows us to generalize the results to the universe of comparable studies. Similarly, if we believed that all of these studies were based on the same population and were identical to each other in all important respects, we would use the fixed effect model to estimate the common effect size here. And that effect size would apply only to that one population. However, again, that is clearly not the case. While these studies are similar to each other in the sense that they all enrolled SUD patients, they are not based on the same population, and they do vary from each other in many important ways. Therefore, again, we apply the random effects model. And this also allows us to generalize the results to the universe of comparable studies. Next, let's consider how we estimate Toss squared. Whenever we use the random effects model, we need to compute Toss squared, the variation in true effect size across studies. In a simple analysis, when we have only one set of studies, we compute Toss squared across all those studies. But when we have subgroups, we must compute Toss squared within subgroups. To see the value of TOA squared, I click Next Table. For the first set of studies, TOA squared is estimated as 0 0.014. And for the second set of studies, TOA squared is estimated as 0 
Let's come back here and I will superimpose those two values. Tau squared here is 0 0.014 and Tau squared here is 0 0.071. At this point, we have two options for how to use these estimates. We can pool the two estimates. If we do that, we will get a pooled estimate of 0 0.021 and then we can use that pooled estimate for both subgroups. Or we can apply each estimate to the corresponding subgroup. Since Tau squared plays a role in the weights assigned to each study, the decision that we make will affect the values that we see here and here. The first option is to pool the two values to get one common estimate, and then apply that estimate to both subgroups. And that yields the numbers that I see here. This mean is 0.577 with a standard error of 0 0.071. And this mean is 0.162 with a standard error of 0.152. The second option is not to pull the two estimates of Tau squared. Rather, we would use the value of 0 0.014 to compute the statistics for this set of studies and we would use the value of 0 0.071 to compute the statistics for this set of studies. That would yield the numbers that I see here. This mean is 0.572 with a standard error of 0 0.067, and this mean is 0.175 with a standard error of 0.191. In almost all cases, I want to pull the estimates. Why do I choose to pull the estimates? The reason is that an estimate of Tau squared based on a small number of studies is not reliable. The estimate here is based on 13 studies and is not very reliable. The estimate here is based on four studies and is not reliable at all. So if we used the two estimates without pooling, these estimates would be poor. By contrast, if we pool them, we have an estimate based on 17 studies which is better. Obviously, when we pull the two values, we're losing information. If the variance in effects for this kind of studies is actually greater than the variance in effects for this type of studies, we lose that information when we pool. However, the amount of error that we introduce by pooling is likely to be much less than the amount of error we introduce by estimating Tau squared based on four studies. And so this is the option I've chosen here. How do I specify which option I want to use? I click Computational Options, Mixed and Random Effects Options. In the top part of this panel, I choose the option to pool the two values. To this point, I've explained that we want to choose a random effects analysis. Now I need to discuss why this is called a mixed effects analysis rather than a random effects analysis. The reason is that we need to choose a statistical model at two levels. Within subgroups, we're using random effects. That is, we use a random effects model to synthesize the data from these studies and yield these numbers, and we use a random effects analysis to synthesize the data from these studies and yield these numbers. At the same time, however, we're using a fixed effects model to select the two subgroups, and those are the subgroups which exclude SUD patients or include SUD patients. The two subgroups are fixed. The word fixed here does not mean that the two groups are the same, since obviously they're not. Rather, they are fixed in the sense that they have been selected or identified. In other words, we care about these specific subgroups only. We want to know the mean effect here and here. We will not be generalizing from these two subgroups to other subgroups. To specify that we will be using fixed effects for the subgroups, I click Computational Options, 
mixed and random effects analysis. And this selection is made on the bottom part of the panel. And I select the option to combine subgroups using a fixed effects model. To recap, we'll be using the fixed effects model to identify the specific subgroups that we care about. We set that here. And we will be using the random effects model within subgroups. And we set that here. Since we're using fixed effects at one level and random effects at the other, this is called a mixed effects model. I discussed this further in my workshop, but these are almost always the options that you will want to use. Now let's return to the key finding. The difference between this mean and this one is statistically significant. What does that tell us? The answer is probably not what you'd expect. I am able to say that the effect size here was greater than the effect size here. However, I cannot say that this is due to the fact that these studies excluded SQD patients while these studies enrolled SUD patients. Let me say that again. I can say that the effect size is higher here than here and that the difference is statistically significant. But I cannot say that this difference is due to the inclusion or exclusion of SUD patients. And that holds true despite the fact that all the studies in the analysis were randomized controlled trials. This may seem counterintuitive, so let me unpack this. Consider the Adler study. The effect size is 0 0.530 with a confidence interval of 0.256 to 0.804. We can test the null hypothesis that the treatment was no better than the placebo. The Z value for that test is 3.786 and the P value is less than 0.001. Can we conclude that the treated group did better than the placebo group? The answer is yes. Can we conclude that the drug was responsible for this difference? Again, the answer is yes. We can draw this conclusion because this study was a randomized control trial. Adler started with a sample of patients. Some were randomized to the drug, while others were randomized to a placebo. Assuming that the randomization process worked properly, the two groups are similar to each other in all important ways except for this one, whether they receive the drug or the placebo. Therefore, if one group does better than the other, we can assume that this is due to the impact of the drug. This logic applies to every one of these studies, and it also applies to the mean effect size for this subgroup of studies. In each study, the use of randomization allows us to assume a causal relationship, and that protection carries over from the individual studies to the summary effect. If the mean effect size is statistically significant, we can assume that the drug is responsible. And so, for this subgroup of studies, we conclude that methylphenidate is more effective than placebo for increasing cognitive function. The same idea applies to the studies in this set. The mean effect size here is not statistically significant, but if it was, we could assume that the drug was responsible. By contrast, consider what happens when we want to compare the mean effect size for these studies versus the mean effect size for these studies. As we saw a moment ago, the difference in means is statistically significant. And so we can say that the drug is more effective in these studies than it is in these studies. But we cannot say that the inclusion or exclusion of SQD patients is responsible for the difference. And the reason is that we did not use a random process to assign studies to include or exclude SUD patients. Therefore, there might be other variables which are confounded with SUD. For example, Suppose that the studies which excluded SUD patients 
tended to use a higher dose of the drug, while studies which included SUD patients tended to use a lower dose of the drug. We chose to call these groups SUD excluded versus SUD included, but it's possible that we could also have labeled these studies high dose and low dose. And it's possible that dose rather than SUD is responsible for the difference in means. Or it's possible that studies which excluded SUD patients tended to be long-term studies, while studies that enrolled SUD patients tended to be short-term studies. And it's possible that study duration rather than SUD is responsible for the smaller effect that we see here. Again, we chose to call these groups SUD excluded versus SUD included, but it's possible that a more appropriate label would have been long-term studies versus short-term studies. In other words, it's possible that study duration rather than SUD is responsible for the difference in means, and so on for any other potential confounds. The key point is that even when all the studies in the analysis are randomized controlled trials, the difference between subgroups is almost always observational rather than causal. So we can say that the effect size was larger in studies that excluded SUD patients, but we cannot say that this is due to the exclusion of those patients. It might be due to that, but it could also be due to some other factor which is confounded with SUD. There's one more point I want to make before moving on. This is the mean effect size for studies that excluded SUD patients, and this is the mean effect size for studies that enrolled SUD patients. This is the mean effect size across all studies. We need to ask if it makes sense to report this value. In some cases, it will make sense to report this value, and in some cases, it will not. But it's important to understand what this value represents. The mean here is a weighted mean of this mean and this one. Since this subgroup has more studies than this one, it will tend to carry more weight in computing the overall mean. The mean effect size here can be thought of as the mean effect size in a universe where roughly 75% of the studies exclude SUD patients and roughly 25% include SUD patients. I'm not sure this is a universe that I would care about, and so I would choose to remove the line with the overall effect size. And to do that, I deselect this button. And the overall effect size is now hidden. On the other hand, if the mean in all subgroups had been comparable, I may have elected to display the overall mean. So that's a basic look at subgroups analysis. Now let's move on to a meta-regression. We just looked at SUD as a potential moderator. The other potential moderator we want to look at is dose. Since dose is a continuous variable, we cannot use subgroup analysis to look at its relationship with effect size. Instead, we'll use meta-regression. First, I need to remove the subgrouping. I click Computational Options, Group By, and Reset. Then, I click Analysis, Meta-regression, 2. This frame shows all the moderators I had identified on the data entry screen. These are dose and SUD. Note that this includes both continuous and categorical moderators, since both can be used in a meta-regression. I click on dose, and I click add to main screen. The program moves dose from here to here. I close this panel. I add a check mark for dose, and then I click Run Regression. 
and I click Run Regression, the program generates many pages of statistics. In this video, I'm going to look at three of these. First, we can look at the unique impact of each covariate. For that, we look to this table. This table reports the statistics for each covariate with all other covariates held constant. I'll come back to this momentarily. But first, I'd like to see a plot of the data, which will provide some context for understanding the statistics. I click Scatter Plot, and the program switches to this screen. The title is Regression of Standardized Difference in Means on Dose. The x axis is dose. The scale goes from 10 to 100. The actual doses range from roughly 30 to 80. The y-axis is the effect size. The scale goes from minus 0.80 to plus 1.60. The actual effects range from minus 0.25 to plus 1.30. The regression line moves from the lower left to the upper right. As the dose gets higher, the effect size gets higher. For studies where the dose is 30 units, the predicted effect size is roughly 0.25. For studies where the dose is 80 units, the predicted effect size is roughly 0.75. So, as the dose increases by 50 milligrams, the effect size increases by roughly 50 points. The fact that the number of units matches the number of points is simply a coincidence. To see the actual numbers, let's return to the main results screen. This table shows the relationship between each variable and effect size when all other variables are held constant. In this case, the only variable in the equation is dose, and so this is simply the relationship between dose and effect size. As dose increases by one milligram or one unit, the effect size increases by 0 0.0093 units. I could round that to 0 0.01. As dose increases by one unit, the effect size increases by roughly 0 0.01. Or as dose increases by 10 units, the effect size increases by roughly 0 0.10, or as dose increases by 50 units, the effect size increases by roughly 0 0.50, which is what we saw in the plot. As dose increased by 50 units, from 30 to 80, the effect size increased by roughly 0.50. We can also test the null hypothesis that there is no relationship between dose and effect size. In other words, that the true coefficient is zero. The z-value for that test is 2.34, and the p-value is 0 0.0323. If we're using a criterion alpha of 0 0.05, we would reject the null hypothesis that there's no relationship between dose and effect size. Next, we can ask if the covariates, as a set, are able to explain any of the variance in effect size. For that, we look at this table. Where the table at the top provides information for each covariate with all other covariates held constant, this table provides information for the full set of covariates. Put another way, this asks if all the covariates as a set are able to explain any of the variance in effect size. In this case, since there's only one covariate in the analysis, this analysis is the same as this one. This analysis uses a q-value rather than a z-value. The q-value is 4.58 with one degree of freedom and a p-value of 0 0.0323. Since there's only one covariate, this p-value is addressing the same null hypothesis as this one, and the two values are therefore the same. And next, we can ask if the covariates, as a set, are able to explain all of the variance in effect size. For that, we come back to this part of the screen. 
Notice that this block actually has two parts. The part that we just looked at addresses the question, do the covariates explain any of the variation in effects? The second part asks if the covariates explain all of the variation in effects. To explain what that means, let's have another look at the plot. We have the regression line, and we have the individual studies. The null hypothesis being tested is that dose is able to explain all of the variation in effects. Put another way, the null hypothesis being tested is that the true effect size for all studies falls directly on the regression line. Of course, most of the observed effects fall some distance from the regression line. But the null hypothesis refers to the true effects rather than the observed effects. The null hypothesis is that the true effect size for this study is actually here. And the observed effect size is here only because of sampling error. Similarly, the true effect size for this study is actually here. And the observed effect size is here only because of sampling error. And so on for all the other studies. To test the null hypothesis, we use a q-value. The q-value is 24.14, with 15 degrees of freedom, and a p-value of 0 0.0627. By convention, we use a criterion alpha of 0 0.10 to test this null hypothesis. On that basis, we would reject this null hypothesis, and we would conclude that dose does not explain all of the variation in effects. Taking these two elements together, we conclude that those explains some of the variation in effect size, but not all of the variation in effect size. This was intended as an overview of the meta-regression module. In my workshops, I go into a lot of additional detail. For a more complete discussion of meta-analysis, consider subscribing to our workshops. These are now available online as well as in person. For information, visit metaanalysisworkshops.com. And this is also where you can download the free program to compute prediction intervals. In this analysis, I used the software Comprehensive Meta Analysis. For information about the software, please visit metaanalysis.com. My name is Michael Borenstein. My email is michael at metaanalysis.com. Feel free to contact me with any comments or questions.